Hello, I'm V.V. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with my old friend Richard Fox, a political analyst who's been looking at the New Mexico scene for well over three to four decades, I guess now. And uh, he's here to give us a wrap-up and a rundown on tomorrow's election. Uh, which is very tight in some places and not so tight in others, with some key races and some big moments in the state house. Uh, much to cover, uh, and it's a real honor to have him here with us today, and I'm really looking forward to the kinds of insights that Richard always always brings to these heady matters. Uh, Richard, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Barrett. It's good to be with you. After a long summer of politics... <laughs> frolic and fun. It's nice to be back with the Mercury. Nice to be back in this beautiful library. So as we see, this is, of course, a highly contentious midterm election run by enormous amounts of money um, and actually having a major new appearance of social media affecting uh, low information voters, if you will, which is, which is your wonderful phrase, and you're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But this is a very, very contentious midterm election, and I really don't, I don't remember one that's been as quite as nasty and as important as this one. So I know you have some overall views you'd like to give us, and then we'll, then we'll try to get into to all of the races uh, and sort of scope them out a little bit. Well, let me, let me say first that um, I want to quote that, that famous dugout philosopher, Yogi Berra. <laughs> Um, who said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's sort of predicate all of this on, on Yogi, at least in, in part. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the political environment and uh, all the things that are sort of swirling in it, producing, uh, I think, in some ways, a, a, very, uh, a very irrational electorate. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I see 2014, this 2014 midterm, is basically a, a reset election. It's a status quo election. Um, I think the big change is coming. Change, not necessarily progress, is coming in 2016, then in 2018 with the governors, and then 2020 with the redistricting, what I'll call the redistricting election. Yeah. So this one is, while important, I wouldn't want to minimize it, um, is is something of a of a of a uh, a status quo reset election? There's much stasis for various reasons in in the country in in the uh, in the political process. A lot of stasis, a lot of dysfunction, and uh, in a ideologically divided nation, Boy. we are we are uh, ideologically divided. Um, we have a bored, cynical, low information. Uh, electorate, and uh, frankly, they know much of the system, I'm sorry to say, is rigged. And that factor alone influences turnout, especially in a midterm. Um, America in, and, and New Mexico, I would add, are stuck. Uh, we can't make forward progress on major critical issues. Uh, like climate change, like poverty, like in economic inequality, like immigration. We, we are stuck. And I think this has produced two electorates. There are two electorates in America today. One is the presidential electorate. Uh, every four years, we elect or reelect a president. And this, this produces or this contains a certain kind of electorate. It's more ethnic minorities, more women. It is younger. It is more urban. And um, therefore, the Democrats are, have been very, very good at electing Democratic presidents. Um, on the other hand, in the midterm electorate, the one we're looking at now, of course, is older, whiter, grayer, more rural, uh, extremely conservative, right. frankly, in a moderately conservative country, but 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 extremely conservative, uh, more more suburban, more exurban. Uh -huh. 
so you have you have these two different electorates and neither is good neither electorate is especially good for for each party in the midterms the democratic uh, party suffers a disadvantage uh, regarding turnout in midterms in presidential elections coming up in 2016 the republicans face a disadvantage because their particular base and core constituencies are not presidential ones, so they have trouble electing presidents. Um, Midterm election, it's the opposite. GOP has an advantage, given their base and their core constituencies, and with regard to the fact that older, grayer voters vote, rural voters vote at midterms, and very often uh, groups like millennials, and even ethnic minorities tend to vote less in midterm elections. Why is that the case? I find that really astonishing. I, I, I mean, it reads totally true to me, but I don't get, I don't get the reasons behind it. I, I think it, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly uh, a sort of sad historical fact. Okay. But I think it goes back to, um, I, I think it goes back to the, to the, uh, to the founding of the country where we had a, uh, a divided nation, one slave, one free. We had um, basically uh, an elite versus the rest. And right from the start, uh, there was this elite democracy created um, in which you have that kind of, those kinds of divisions. Uh, a more, an elite minority versus a rabble, a... a a majority, uh, fearful of a, the, the, the elite, fearful of a tyranny of a majority. And I think this, from right from the start, the, the, uh, the vote, as it were, was qualified. The electorate was, mm. uh, shall we say, small compared to the population of the country, right from the start. So what all this means, of course, is, is turnout. This is nothing new. Turnout, particularly in midterms remains key. Uh, turnout, turnout, turnout. And the Democrats obviously have to have to try to uh, answer the question of can the Democratic candidates rally in this midterm without Obama at the top of the ticket? Uh, that, that's a big that's a very big question. And and given his unpopularity, which in many ways is is uh, uh, unfortunate and and in some cases inexplicable, but there it is. He is unpopular, and then you have the impact of money. We were talking earlier about the impact of social media, social media advertising, and how many people uh, that you and I know, students especially, get their get their information, political intelligence from Facebook. Well, I mean, Facebook uh, is an example of how big, dark money with secret donors sells bad ideas. <laughs> and, and you've got that. I mean, that's not just Facebook. It's not just social media. But you've got big, dark money selling bad ideas from money from secret donors all across the electorate these days. Yes. I mean, it's widespread. It's, it's, frankly, it's ruining the democracy. Uh, it's abscessed the country in terms of our electoral process and posing the question, have we lost democracy in America? I mean, that sounds very uh, uh, doomsday, but uh, politically doomsday. But, but ask yourself, the Koch brothers will spend something north of $120 million just themselves on congressional races this fall, wow. up north of $120 million. And they've, 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 they've spent some money in New Mexico, as you know. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they've been to New Mexico, enjoying our beautiful resorts and other pleasures. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so this election, in addition to be, being status quo, a reset election, I think, is also a choice versus referendum election. Uh, the Republicans want to make it a referendum on Obama and Washington. Um, the Democrats want to make it a choice election in that you have a lot of extremism in the country. Uh, 
But extremism, it seems to me, clarifies choices. It makes them clearer. Sure. And, and the Democrats want to make those choices, i.e. extremists on the right, they want to make that very clear to make themselves distinct from that kind of extremism. Uh, Republicans want to make it a referendum on Obama. And, and so I see it also as a choice versus referendum election as well. So let's start to get into these races. We have the governor's race. We have one of the most important races, I think, is, is for state land commissioner. We have three house races, a Senate race. We have all of the smaller office holders. And uh, they're all very, very important. Although we have failed our, our, our civics tests and lessons in America quite profoundly because we don't even know what these people do mostly. But we've interviewed most candidates, well, uh, most progressive candidates in New Mexico so far, and we've learned a little bit about these offices. So let's start, let's start with Dunn and Powell and then go to King and Martinez. Uh, because I think probably the most contentious race right now is, is, is for state land commissioner. They both represent two, two, two ancient political dynasties in New Mexico. Aubrey Dunn used to be uh, the Senate pro tem leader uh, in, uh, for the Democrats in the 60s, 70s, and mid 80s. And, and, and Ray Powell, the first, used to, uh, uh, was a candidate for governor. So here we have a a sagebrush rebel who believes in privatizing public lands, basically. On the one side, Aubrey Dunham, and the other side we have a traditional environmentalist who, who has made a, a tremendous amount of money for state, uh, for state education, doing the things that that office was designed to do. So what's your analysis of how this is going to turn out? Let me just say, before we get into uh, Powell Dunn, um, <coughs> You know, this low information electorate cynical board has produced a lot of, of, of irrationality, it seems to me. Uh, and by that I mean irrationality by which many, many voters of both parties, mostly Democrats, however, um, vote against their social, political, and economic interests, making them, making them irrational. Um, now... On the Powell-Dunn race, uh, Aubrey Dunn, uh, a rancher indeed, represents, uh, and, and I think he is attempting to trade on this in the, in the campaign, is, is attempting to trade on, on the anti-Washington, anti-Eastern uh, Washington dysfunction theme. It's prevalent in a lot of places, but I think it's prevalent here with the privatization, the sagebrush idea, uh, the, the Clive and Bundy idea, all right. of this, which is uh, hot stuff in the West. Water, land, environment, guns, the usual menu of issues in, in the West. I think, I think Aubrey Dunn is, 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 uh, is attempting to trade on this. Um, and, of course, the word regulation is code. The word regulation is code for Washington. Right. Uh, corruption is code for a lot of things, but, but uh, corruption is another code word for politicians. I mean, Washington right now is just barely more popular than Ebola and gonorrhea <laughs> in the country, <laughs> and, and particularly in the West. Um, so... Um, I think Dunn premises his campaign on that Cato Institute, privatization, sagebrush rebellion, privatize uh, for what? For private profit uh, in the end. Um, on the other hand, um, you, have, you have Ray Powell Jr., a solid workmanlike public servant who has made uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars for the state of New Mexico um, in, in his stewardship of public lands. I think that there is an issue that, that um, I had to clarify, you had to clarify for me, regarding uh, the land-grant permanent fund and its use and, and uh, Mr. Powell's position. Uh, I know he would like to acquire more federal land for the state and use its revenue to invest in in places like education, 
So I, I think if we want to if we want to predict, um, I, I saw that that Aubrey Dunn was a percentage point ahead, which is nothing in the final days uh, over over Ray Powell. But I I um I, I think that that Ray Powell is going to win is going to win this thing. So let's go to the hottest race of all, of course, which is really not hot at all because. There's a winner and a loser way behind. This would be the Martinez King race, uh, a race against um, uh, between basically a person that comes from a, another long political dynasty, which no one seems to remember, and someone who is fundamentally a kind of a, a carpetbagger, I would say. Uh, and I'm sure I'll take a lot of hit for that, but more than happy to. But so where does this thing stand? What the heck happened? Why can't the Democrats uh, do something better than, than they're doing at the moment here? Well, believe me, this is nothing personal, but um, I think the Democratic Party in New Mexico has, has a couple of significant problems right now. Um, one is, with all respect, and again, this is nothing personal with regard to um, formerly Diane Dennish as a gubernatorial candidate, and now Gary King is a gubernatorial candidate. Uh, I must say that, that as candidacies, these were relatively weak. Good people with good ideas who have made good governors, who will make, one may make a good governor, Gary King. But weak, weak campaigners and weak candidates. The old politics without governance problem. There are those who can campaign and win, but can't govern. There are those who could be very good at governing, but can't win. And also, the other problem, of course, is general. Is there's a general, I think, leadership vacuum in the party. The Democratic bench is relatively weak for the top races. Now, I think we have two up-and-comers we'll talk about later. Yeah. One is Hector Balderas, uh, and the other is Tim Keller. Uh, for the future, for the top races. Yeah. As far as the, I, I, I think that I, I'm surpri mildly surprised that the King legacy, the Bruce King legacy, is not, is not uh, cutting more ice across the state. Uh, I think that the, the legacy is largely forgotten. And I think that the memory lapse began when Gary Johnson defeated Bruce King. And, and that was primarily because there was so much new demographics, so many, so, an influx of new people, new voters to New Mexico, that they had no memory of Bruce King or his legacy. What year was that? Um, well, it was the, it was the, um, yeah, no, it was, it was later than that. Okay. It was later than that. Uh, and then, you know, Johnson served for eight years, right. defeating, defeating, among other people, Marty Chavez. Yeah, it was another weekend. Who who, uh, who was also looking back, relatively weak. So they they have those two problems: one, a a shallow bench, shall we say, for the moment, and uh, the inability to produce strong, aggressive candidates at the at the at the at the gubernatorial level. Let's put it that way in that in that particular race. So you have King, um, who is really not able to provide coattails to the rest of these down-ballot candidates. Um, no coattails, but I, I really think, when I look at it, I see Tom Udall as the top of the ticket in New Mexico, sure. uh, rather than the governor, the gubernatorial candidate. And I think that that will help. I think Tom at the top of the ticket uh, makes, makes, longer, makes for longer coattails than, than Governor King. So we can look at it that way. If you want in a moment to talk about Susanna and Gary, uh, we can do that as well. So, so let's, um, let's look at, at the gubernatorial race uh, in a little more detail. And then let's expand it to talk about uh, Wei and, and Udall in a little more detail too. And then, then we'll sort of, sort of segue down into those three House seats, uh, uh, national House seats, which are – Looking pretty good in a couple of ways for Democrats, and and there's a real dicey race down south, which I would really love to get your insights into. I think um, looking at looking at uh, King and Martinez, which I've which I've done a lot of, 
Um, two things stand out and uh, for Susanna's uh, st strong political position. One is her ability to attract Democratic crossover votes, uh, particularly in the North, older Hispanic crossover votes. Uh, I think that's a, that, that has a lot to do with her electoral success. Second, what stands out for me with Susanna is the inability of, of uh, New Mexico, the New Mexico press, the New Mexico media, um, to somehow avoid doing an in-depth, I'm talking about a deep, deep analysis of her stewardship, of her actual governorship, uh, in terms of actually governing the state. Now, yes, there have been summaries. There's been, you know, the tax cut, and you know, the, the her her, uh, her apparently longing, longing desire to um, get rid of driver's licenses for illegals. And um, there have been summaries of these things. Oh, yeah, they're reported, but no one has done uh, any kind of with any kind of depth. And this, of course, goes to accountability. Um, Gary King, on the other hand, uh, low on money, very little money, comp especially compared to Susanna, has 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 um, you know uh, has not had the ability to aggressively attack her record and um, uh, make her account for it in the campaign. You have to be able to do that in a campaign. You have to make her uh, account and be aggressive about it. Um, the other thing is, is that is that, and this is why I say earlier, New Mexico is stuck. Um, New Mexico needs uh, a transformative, or let's say, a group of transformative leaders. Um, we can't, we can't get at, or we don't get at, the big issues of poverty of climate change, real environmental, uh, uh, real environmental policy. We can't get at that. And yes, we can balance the budget every year. Every governor is required to do it, although Susanna makes her balancing the budget at least one year, um, some sort of um, parting of the Red Sea, <laughs> which it's not. Every governor has to balance the budget. I was in Santa Fe working um, um, in the 80s when when the, a price of the barrel of oil has gone to went down to eleven dollars. Now Gary King has mentioned this, but not in a particularly aggressive way. These are the kinds of things that New Mexico needs to attack from a policy standpoint, and this is why we're stuck. Uh, corporate tax cuts. We learned, I learned in the 1980s that corporate tax cuts will not lure business to New Mexico. Sure. And we're proving it once again with the Tesla failure and this business about we can't compete with Texas and Colorado. And there's an excellent chance we never will compete with those two states for a lot of other reasons besides tax rates. And, and, Democratic gubernatorial candidates need to aggressively educate and send that message to to the voters of New Mexico. And it hasn't been done. Tom Udall has been in New Mexico politics for a very long time and, uh, in my judgment, has, has been a stand-up guy in the Senate. What, uh, what's the outlook on, on that race in your mind? And, and uh, where does... Where does Way's message fall short of Martinez's? I think, you know, I think Tom Udall has is, is been a, a remarkably good senator, not only in Washington, but in New Mexico. Um, senator Udall has built himself a, a strong reputation as an honest liberal, making good policy in a Congress where it's extremely difficult to make policy. I think he's in very good shape. I, I think, uh, although there are some late numbers that show Alan Way, at least one poll, making a bit of a of a surge. 
Uh, I think that's largely due to television ads, both good and bad for, for way. In other words, people uh, here in the, in the waning hours of the campaign are at least recognizing Alan Way because of television right. and, that, and uh, those ads. And I think that's what's boosted his numbers a bit. But I think Tom Udall is comfortably, uh, has, a, has a comfortable lead. And um, as far as Alan Way uh, and the distinction between Alan Way and Susanna Martinez, I think, I think it's this. I think that, that um, uh, Alan Way makes no secret of his love of the of the right wing agenda, right. he makes no secret of that. Um, as an extremist, as a extreme conservative, um, with a corporate tinge, if you will, um, Susanna, on the other hand, manages somehow to to mask and moderate. Her very, very conservative views in a broader based appeal. Now, I think one of the dangers of her being reelected is that I think that the mask will come off in the second term. In other words, I think the mask comes off in the second term and she becomes, as I've said earlier uh, to the Mercury, um, she becomes Scott Walker Light, where she goes after collective bargaining, she goes after public pensions. And she becomes a much more aggressive uh, right winger than she has been in the previous four years. That's the difference. So we have three really interesting house races in New Mexico. Uh, the most interesting in my judgment is Steve Pierce versus Rocky Lara. I don't think there's going to be much of a problem with the <coughs> Ben Ray Lujan and Mr. Beard. Uh, nor do I think that uh, Michelle Grisham is going to have a hard time with Mr. Fresh. Fresh. I can't get his name Freeze. right. Freeze. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> um, but what about uh, what about this race race down south? From everything I've been seeing, and I've been trying to look at it fairly closely, uh, it's it's really very very tight. And I'm wondering. Um, I just saw a Steve Pierce ad which tried to make him a you know, uh, you know, a down-to-earth man of the people and all, and all. Uh, but do you think there's a there's a legitimate reason to hope for uh, for Rocky Lara down south? I think let's let's quickly go go through the um, the first two. Okay. Uh, ben Ray Lujan cruises to re-election. Jefferson Byrd again with a traditional conservative Republican, maybe with a slight. Uh, garnish of Tea Party uh, will be easily dispatched by Jefferson uh, by uh, Ben Ray Lujan. Um, Michelle Lujan Grisham has is done a masterful job of uh, soon to dismiss and dispatch another uh, sort of traditional conservative Republican with a Tea Party tint, who's based his campaign on uh, being anti-regulation. Again, talking in, 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 the, in the Tea Party code, uh, using the word regulation over and over again. Um, and so we, go, we, look, we look down south. And this has been a very, very difficult, uh, this has been a hard nut to crack for the Democrats over a number of years. I mean, we could go back to, uh, you know, to Harold Runnels, a conservative Democrat. But it's a very uh, it's a very tough nut to crack. I think that that Roxanne Lara, um, Rocky Lara, has has a has a uh, maybe a slightly better than fifty fifty chance. Wow, slightly better to to upset Steve Pierce because uh, once again we have changing demographics in the South. Right. Yes, we have that core ranching, farming, uh, little Texas uh, aspect, which is traditional. But then we have a city like Las Cruces, 
where you have rapidly changing demographics and where Steve Pierce uses what has become a Republican trope. Um, whenever you want to talk about in, uh, immigration with a Republican, they always say the same thing. And that is, we've got to secure the border first. In a time when immigration from, from uh, Mexico, Central and Latin America, has been in the lowest it's been in a long time, we have to secure the border. This has become a way of not talking about immigration. Right. And that, of course, is Steve Pierce's trope. Rocky Lara, on the other hand, uh, advances comprehensive immigration reform. And because of the, the demographic makeup, the socioeconomic makeup of the Southern District, so-called, I, I, think, I think Rocky, has a, has a, Rocky Lara has, a, has a, a slightly better than 50-50 chance to upset him. I have to write him. <laughs> but that's obvious, I'm sure. <laughs> Let me ask you uh, now about the the other really interesting and sort of fascinating race between uh, Deanna Duran and and uh, Maggie Tillis Oliver. Duran, uh, from my my recollection, was the chief vote getter in the last gubernatorial election, where she actually got more votes than Susana Martinez did. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but now she is practically deadlocked, or as a matter of fact, I think she is, uh, she is deadlocked with a very appealing candidate uh, in Oliver. Um, how is that, what does that tell us again about where New Mexico is going or where, I mean, I mean this all seems, it's so up and down in so many different ways that the term irrationality really seems very, very applicable to me. Why should this race be so close? Well, they're, they're, um, regarding the Secretary of State's race, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, this is an office that's traditionally been held by, by Democrats. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that here's, a, here's a case where Susanna's coattails, even though, though D, uh, Diana Duran was a, a better vote getter, apparently, than, than Susanna. Um, here's a case where where Susanna's coattails are helping uh, Secretary of State Duran this time around. She's helping. I think the governor is helping keeping that race to keep that race close. The other thing that's helping and keeping it close is um, Diana Duran's aggressive use of the voter ID. Um, a.k.a. voter suppression issue. And here she's managed to do what a lot of Republicans have done in, in many, many states across this country. And that is confuse yes. voter fraud, voting fraud, with voter registration fraud. In other words, there ought to be a, dis there, there, there's a distinction. Um, and that distinction is this. Most so-called voter fraud, when it exists, is at the voter registration phase. Now, this is the, this is the a basic fundamental, this is the basic fundamental job of the Secretary of State. Voter registration. And, and obviously all of the respective county clerks that have that job too yeah. at the county level. Voter registration. This is where most of your fraud is going to occur. Now, where fraud does not occur, I mean, it's like, you know, searching for a whooping crane or something. <laughs> um, where it does not occur is where people attempt to assume another person's identity in order to vote is virtually, it, it's not a problem. And for the Republicans, it's been a problem. Uh, it's been a non-problem in search of a problem, put it that way. So this is, this is and, and it is the fundamental job of the Secretary of State and, and the county clerk, which Maggie Toulouse Oliver has been Bernalillo County Clerk. That's their job particularly at the registration level, not 
people misimpersonating uh, right. or impersonating someone. Um, that's not that's not a problem. Now, vo- voter suppression uh, is as bad, I think, now as it as it was in the nineteenth century, pre civil rights, pre voting rights. You are you are taking hundreds of thousands of people off the rolls in Texas. Because in Texas, you can use your concealed carry ID, but you can't use your student ID right. in voting. And and with with then when you you include Native Americans and others, um, you are excluding hundreds of thousands of people. In I'm, I'm using the example of Texas, but it's voter suppression has become a very effective tactic by the Republican Party to suppress the Democratic vote. Everyone knows this. It's not a secret. It's been a very effective tactic. And I think that Diana Duran has has been relatively effective in tagging uh, Maggie Toulouse Oliver with this, I think, this this essentially red herring as far as as far as uh, Miss Oliver is concerned. Now, the other thing is, this made this race close, is, is that Maggie Toulouse Oliver is way ahead in Bernalillo County. And I think she's doing okay up north in the northern counties. But, but Maggie Toulouse Oliver has needed and still needs, I don't know what she's doing in the closing hours of this, days of this campaign, but she needs to go north. She needs an aggressive effort to, to make a closing argument in northern New Mexico, and I think that lead, that lead, uh, uh, or her lead, will will widen. She'll she'll do a lot better. She needs to go north. There are a few other um, major races. Um, it's always surprising to me that 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 Susana Martinez is number two in command. Uh, uh, Attorney uh, Rydell. Uh, is so far behind Hector Balderas, who who used to be uh, the state auditor, which of course is not a highly public job. It's surprising to me that that um, that Eichenberg, uh, running for state auditor now, uh, I'm sorry, state treasurer now, is a little bit behind uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, which I don't quite understand the dynamic there, and I'm also. Uh, not at all surprised <clears throat> that Tim Keller, who is a very aggressive, extremely intelligent, very well presented young man, uh, should be should be so far ahead of Mr. Aragon in the in the race for for um, uh, state auditor. Uh, what what do you think? Why why is Hector Balderas uh, so 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 far out from this? deeply connected Republican attorney who is as close to the governor as anybody, really. Why hasn't that run over? Okay, we're, we're talking about the attorney general's race and um, why uh, Sue Rydell, with all of her connections and past history and association with Governor Martinez, is not is not closer yeah. to Hector Balderas in this race. I think here's a case where, where the governor doesn't provide any coattails. And I also think that, that uh, on the other hand, I think it's a, uh, the difference in this race is, is, is all about the attractiveness, frankly, the attractiveness of Hector Balderas. And... Um, he is a rising star, and I think that that the only thing I would I would request of Hector Balderas is uh, when he was or when he as he is state auditor, I think that the state of auditor's office in general in New Mexico has to be a much more aggressive, much more powerful, much more expanded office, mm-hmm. and that that may be a that may those are words for Tim Keller. To expand the office, to make it more influential, to make it more aggressive. Um, auditor means a lot. It could mean management audits. 
It could be not just financial audits. It, it has to be an expanded, almost an investigative office in the state. So that's, that's really a message for, for Tim Keller. Right. Um, rather, but I think that the attractiveness, the general attractiveness, and I, I understand that Hector Balderas has run a pretty, a pretty effective campaign. And, um, despite the fact that Republic, the Republican Association of Attorneys General has put money into Sue Rydell's campaign, there was a little question about a, a secret lawsuit uh, there was a charge that uh, way back, I think it maybe, maybe as far back as five years ago or more, that Hector Balderas was using a, a, an auditor staffer to babysit for him. And this thing got in, in, into the Attorney General's office. And uh, the suit, there was a suit somehow, some way, that was dropped or... We don't know what happened. The, the charge of, of a staffer being a babysitter came to nothing. And this, is, this has been discussed, but not in any sort of widespread public level. So it's, a, it's an effective campaign with an attractive candidate. Um, who's tougher on crime? You know, uh, a former, a former uh, ADA or a former district attorney um can only speak so loudly with that message but i think hector balderas is from his own vantage point has spoken just as loudly in that race and that's why he's ahead and that's why he's going to win let's take another look again at the at the other rising star in the democratic party uh, tim keller uh we did an interview with him here a number of months ago and it was it was just a sterling straight arrow very well informed candidate. Um, it's hard, but but there are a lot of those around, uh, you know, who are who are not going to win races around the country, and who, you know, you know, some could lose here too. Why is he so? He's so effective. Do you think? Here again, I, I think that you have a very attractive candidate with a with a much more widely known track record. I believe that that uh, Senator Keller, State Senator Keller was Senate Majority Whip. Yes. And here is where you not only establish a record, a legislative record, but you establish a political record and a political following. Um, I'm repeating myself because I think the same thing applies to Hector Balderas. Um, Tim Keller is just personally attractive with a moderate liberal philosophy in a very uh, spoken and, and, and projected in a very common sense way. Very progressive, yet common sense, with with actual with actual experience and an actual record that he is able to articulate, in not only in settings like this, in a, you know in a beautiful drawing room, but but um, um, all across this state. I, I like I say between Balderas and Keller, you have two rising stars, and I would expect that that somewhere down the road. Um, one or both of them will run for governor. So now we come to the question of questions. Is New Mexico going to have a Republican majority in the State House of Representatives? This is one of these things which, uh, for people who are interested in local politics, and I suspect they grow fewer and fewer in number all the time, a burning question, because uh, it would have a tremendous impact on the next two years of... of uh, of our, of our life here. Uh, what's your feeling about this, and what races are moving, and what has, what has a certain new scandal that has arisen on, uh, on the horizon done, if anything? The House, the New Mexico House. Utterly fascinating. <laughs> yes. Utterly fascinating, and it's gained some national attention. Um, right now, the there I think there are 29, maybe 30, Republican governors in America. And uh, a, good, a good number of that 29 or 30 have Republican-controlled legislatures. And right now, this is the states, not just in those Republican states, but others. This is what's driving public policy in America. 
right now, the states. And so I don't have to I don't have to tell Mercury viewers the importance of the New Mexico House in this thing. Um, because I think we're, we're, as I said, I think earlier in the, with the Mercury months ago, that, that um, whatever way this goes, whether the Democrats retain control of the House or not, um, you're going, it, we're looking like we're going to have another coalition uh, in the legislature, reminiscent of the, of the cowboy coalition that I observed when I was in Santa Fe. Um, so it's looking that way, regardless of the outcome in the House. I think that that we're talking about um, a narrow, you know, hairline, knife's edge, but a Democratic win to retain control of the House. Very, very narrowly. It's very, very tight. Now, there are a couple of... I, I listed... I think last time I was on the Mercury, I listed 10 key races. And there are a couple of new wrinkles. One of them, I'll put it this way, one of them is, is in House District 30, which is, uh, the incumbent there is Nate Gentry. And uh, Representative Gentry has been talked about, if the House goes Republican, that he is... He is a candidate for speaker, a very likely candidate, and maybe even the next speaker of the House, if if the Republicans would retain control. However, there have been some some problems in Nate Gentry's life over over time. Um, the Democrats see this as a this district as as a potential game changer, because the Democrats and and have found themselves a surprisingly good candidate. In Robert Coffey Jr., right. who a, a Democrat, who's a Highland High School teacher, and and is running a surprisingly good campaign. Now Gentry has his own set of problems. Um, one was a it was a DWI arrest. Um, the other uh, was the fact that he narrowly won. He narrowly won his his reelection. Um, two years ago, only by 53-46, in a race that he was supposed to win by a much, much wider margin up there. The other is, is he had a, some kind of a criminal assault altercation in Washington, D.C., um, which remains somewhat shrouded in mystery. I'm not sure what the outcome or the upshot of that was. And then finally, he received, this did make the papers, um, he received a citation for illegal hunting. Illegal hunting. Now, um, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't personally shoot animals for sport myself. I'm, I'm a fly fisherman. But to be caught hunting illegally, for a prominent member of, of the House of Representatives in any state is, is, is extremely embarrassing, uh, if not shameful. Um, also, he, for some unknown reason, again, another shrouded mystery, he registered under an assumed name <coughs> uh, at a conference for uh, the National Legislative uh, uh, Council which is a, a national organization for state legislators. He registered for some reason under an assumed name. I suspect that he registered under an assumed name. It had something to do with who was going to pay for this conference, I suggest. I'm not sure. But anyway, these kinds of things add up. Uh, making this race um, certainly not only competitive, but, but winnable for the Democrat, Mr. Uh, Mr. Coffey. Well, we've managed to cover the whole field. Uh, I'm really impressed. Do you have any brief last-minute uh, last remarks? Once again, and this is nothing new, turnout, turnout is the key. Yeah. I think turnout amongst Democrats, obviously, who, by the way, in, in some early voting 
indicators show that while the Democrats are outpacing Republicans in early voting in New Mexico, they're still not above 50 percent. And so they're lagging a bit. But I think turnout, turnout remains the key. Millennials, younger people seem very much up for grabs, not only in the sense that they're maybe more independent, but are they going to vote at all? So I, I think that the, the key to this election, like many, 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 uh, is, is turnout and uh, what that will mean regarding the outcome. Richard, thank you very, very much. It's been a joy. Thank you, Barrett. Pleasure to be with you as always.